Hello, friends. My name is Steve, and welcome to the Friday Conversation, episode 81. And today we are thrilled to have author Michael J. Sullivan join us, along with Chris and Carl. So, Carl, will you start us off with introductions, please? Yeah, I am uh, Carl Albert. I am a self-published fantasy author currently in uh, the latest Spiffbo. That's the self-published fantasy blog-off. Uh, the name of my book is Truth of Crowns, and yeah, that's all that really matters about me. <laughs> <laughs> it's my entire personality now i've committed to it so far card so far <laughs> <laughs> story's not yet written and uh michael oh yeah i get to yeah. go next we're not gonna go with yeah okay uh i'm michael uh you already introduced me kind of so i don't have to go too much but yeah i'm a fantasy science fiction author i can't say i'm a science fiction author because when i never do that my wife says no you're not i said but i i, I wrote a science fiction now she says that doesn't count it's only one so I, I, I guess it does count. Anyways, so yes, I, I've been self-published, small press published, and traditionally published through New York. So I've done everything, and I I don't regret any of it. Nice. Yeah, that's a good way to start off. And uh, Chris? <laughs> yes, well, I have plenty of regrets, but we'll not take up the whole next couple of hours on that. My name is Chris Mullen, sometimes YouTuber, but mostly just like to hang out uh, on other people's channels, geeking out and talking books and films and whatever whatever else comes comes up yeah. so michael when i was preparing for your for this interview i was bro scrolling through your bio and scrolling down your list of accomplishments and i had to keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling because it's a long list but i think it's the first time we've had a, a new york times best-selling author on the show i think it's oh. the first so thank you for joining us so you don't even realize you're supposed to supply me with champagne, right? Well, I did, but the but mail now the transit's terrible, so I didn't think you'd get there in time. We we expect the best, you know, caviar, champagne. I was supposed to have a limo. I didn't see a limo. I don't know what you guys are doing, but this is this is not acceptable. So next time you have someone, you have people to hurt. You're not going to get any more. I mean, this is not. You're never going to get like you know Patrick Rothfuss or you know Mark Lawrence in here if you don't like. You got to get to that your mom. I have to step my I have to step my game up for sure. I have to get the caviar ready, the champagne, the driver. I have to get a driver that doesn't drink the night before. It's a whole thing. There's a lot of planning involved. <laughs> yeah. Could, could be a bike ride, though, in your case, Steve. Steve, Steve rides uh, long bike rides, so, you know, meet you halfway and say, here, I just found this thought and drop it off. You go for long bike rides, Steve? Yeah, I try and do about 60 what, miles. What kind of bike? Uh, I have, well, what kind of I have a, uh, like a gravel bike. Like It's a, a Poseidon. And, and then I have a, uh, I have a, uh, it's a Poseidon X. And I have oh. a an evil offering mountain bike that I try not to kill myself on or hurt myself too badly. I have the scars to prove it. But, yeah, that's... You need to take your gravel bike out to Moab and try doing the trails out there. That, that'll that kill you. Yeah, or it'll make you a man, one of the two. It's up to you. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's lots of trails here in the state that, uh, uh, yeah, can kill me. And I've taken some nasty spills, so I'm I'm trying to... To not kill myself too soon, you know, have to. Yeah, the rest of the audience probably can't see it, but his face is just smashed in from the many times. <laughs> oh, they know. Yeah, they know. They already know. But it's, it's the sexy voice that gets you by. That's that's okay. all I have going for me. That's it. That's it. I have nothing else. That's all I have to offer. You, you suck, Steve. You suck, Steve. I only have my sexy voice. Like, what, what do the rest of us have? Nothing. Well, for nothing. God's sakes, like, you're Irish. <laughs> you're Irish. I mean, you have the accent. You can pick up no, anyone that's in true. anywhere. That's true. It once people can understand me, get over that hurdle. That that, that, that is true. <laughs> he does. Uh, he does teaches. Well, I I went to a book uh, book convention recently, and there was an Irish author there talking to me, and we were in a, sitting in a group, and we were just chatting, and he left, and everyone else looked at me and said, "I have no idea what he just said." And I was like, "I've been talking to the guy for like half an hour. I understood every word he said." And I, I told Chris, <laughs> "Thank you for, since we've been friends, I can understand what this author was saying, and no one else understood him but me." So it was a moment of accomplishment. It doesn't really matter if it's an Irish author. It doesn't matter if you understood what they said. They just want to talk at you. It's fine. <laughs> this will back me up on this. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Like, it, it's no coincidence that somebody offers you the opportunity to talk, Michael. You say, yeah, absolutely. How long for two hours? That's fine. We'll just get warmed and up. Just don't ask them to sing because then you're really going to be in the shit. <laughs> that's, that's my father. Yeah, that's my father. As, your father. as everyone's Irish father, yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. He's he's the, he's the type of person that goes up at a certain stage of the night to the DJ. And if the DJ you know, has been doing some announcements and kind of saying, next up, you know, we're going to have a take it nice and slow or whatever, he'll just go up and grab the microphone and then just start singing. Oh, don't <laughs> don't invite them to a, to a wedding. 
for God's sake. Doesn't matter what Honestly. band you got, you have a whole new band. <laughs> you have a new band, indeed. American Pie. Oh my God! Every time, every wedding, christening, wake, funeral, anything, American Pie. One American song. Pie. <laughs> That's the thing to you, though, is that you're actually Irish and you're living in Ireland as opposed to being in America, where you're going to hear Irish eyes are smiling. <laughs> <laughs> come back again I, I mean it's just, it's just it's embarrassing but yes if you're drunk enough it doesn't matter it does exactly right that is get in the spirit get in the flow that's exactly I'm sorry Steve I keep feeling I'm just messing this whole no, thing no this, this is what this is this is what we do so no you're you're fitting right in. yeah this is it uh, this is all we have to offer this is we're done uh, why American Pie Chris I'm curious why, why is that the song uh, I think that, that I mean not to get too boring about it, but, but my dad worked, uh, he was a plumber for many years and he worked for many years uh, when there wasn't as much work here. Another kind of Irish kind of stereotype fulfilled um, in Algeria. <laughs> and when they were there, at the end of the night, there was no real entertainment. So they used to entertain each other and they used to just basically sing all the time. And people liked him singing American Pie, apparently at the time. And uh, he just sort of got asked for that again and again and sort of became his trademark. Mm. Um, which That's actually which is a really interesting story. Yeah, so his brother does I Left My Heart in San Francisco. Like they, they both have a song each, you know, it's it's just one of those things. Interesting. It's a very serious endeavour. You know, there's a lot of a lot of <laughs> chest action and stuff goes into it, you know, especially when the uh, the drink's been flowing for most of the night. You know. hmm. Does the performance go up or down with the more alcohol consumed? Is it is it a scale? Well it he he gets to what we call a gulder. I don't know if anybody ever uses that word before a gulder. So it's a really more of a, a, a large shout. <laughs> it's an Irish, an Irish colloquial phrase for a large shout. So it, it comes, the more drunk he gets, it comes more of a gulder than a, than a song, so to speak. So there are bits that he really attacks, you know, and it's really a, a bit of a scream. It's like back when they first started recording sound, they couldn't actually have a microphone. So you had to sing into the opening and you had to really be an Al Jolson where you're just throwing your voice as hard as you can because you got to keep up with the trumpets. Yeah, we, we understand that. Yes. That's him. I'll do a recording sometime. Look, I'll send it to each of us. You can uh, judge it on its merits. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, for sure. But uh, Carl, before we started, you mentioned that uh, Michael had answered a question for you. W what question was it that he answered for you? Yeah, so, I, I mean, for a little bit of more context, if anyone is not familiar, um, Michael is very uh like i think widely known on this particular like reddit and um you know as just like a big helpful voice in the community particularly with like cell publishing and getting started um and I, he and his wife you know I, they you, it's you two who run the business right what business <laughs> yeah it's us your, your, book, your books <laughs> like all of that, I mean, that, that, I, that I write them, she promotes them yeah that's the business there you go. I mean, there I, you go. Yeah. Like I have and an army of people will write to me and say, "Oh my God, I have no idea who's going to read this. It's probably some funky intern." I'm like, "No, it's like me and my wife. That's it." So, yes. <laughs> right. um, there, there you go. And they know their stuff, and they're always very responsive. Um, and Michael, I believe, personally responded uh, to a question I have. I, honestly, at this point, I don't even remember what it was. It was, it was probably something about where to put my book like maybe go kindle exclusive for the ebook um hmm. to get the kdp uh like the kindle um oh my god what is that thing called i'm like having kindle a huge limited. brain fart kindle I'm limited. Sure yeah to get those reads. i remember correctly it was something about you were having problems with your love life and you're trying to figure out how to <laughs> exactly <laughs> and, and, and it just evolved down to like writing but yes yeah, I, I, I was going to the stage atop his mountain um, for advice about how to move forward. It's yeah. it's really tough out here on the West Coast, I can tell you. Dating, oh man. <laughs> um, say, do, you, do you think being a best-selling author will improve my relationship status? Yeah, something along those lines. Oh, there was a, <laughs> there was exactly. a great book. I forget what it was. It was like how to write a novel in which the author was doing a satirical condiment on, on writing. And one of the things was is he, he was writing it with the intention of showing how he knew that writers were like rock stars and that if you wrote a novel you could get laid at any author signing and uh, I just I, I've not experienced that uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great fantasy I don't think it was a realistic accurate portrayal 
I've definitely Probably found the, uh, you know, the, the, the Stephen King approach of like being haunted by like demons and shit as an author is like much more true to life. Like that's probably true. Yeah. <laughs> what's the strangest question you've had, Michael, like that's, that someone came to you with, what's the strangest one you've had that sticks out? The one you just asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, the strangest question I've ever been asked. Uh, wow. Uh, well, I, I recently did an interview with someone who was not... Okay, so whenever I go... Okay, let's roll back just a little bit. You don't mind if I talk for a few minutes? No, um, sorry here. I always find it fascinating that when you watch television shows or, or interviews and they have these, these Hollywood personalities and they ask them a question and they just go on with this wonderful antidote and you're like, wow, did they have that prepared beforehand? And I thought they seem so intelligent because they know exactly what to say. And I realized afterwards, no, that's not the case because now that I've been doing this a while, it's the mere, mere fact that uh, people ask you the same questions over and over and over again so that it, you already know the answers because you know every single question is coming your way. Uh, but I, I did do an interview recently where a woman was clearly trying to not be normal. And I think she was a psychologist. Hmm. And she was asking really unusual questions, things along the lines of, if you were a tree, what would you be? It got to that level. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, yeah, these are questions I have never encountered before. <laughs> uh, but it was just like, I'm trying to get into your psyche. I'm trying to figure out what kind of a person you are. I'm like, interesting. Uh, Read but the books. I'm not sure how practical this would be for anyone actually watching. But yeah, those those were the kind of that was the weirdest, strange, strangest ones. But no, nothing nothing has been unusual if you're talking about something that has something to do with writing or anything of that nature. Uh, but yeah, I've been asked most questions that I can imagine. <laughs> Almost every single person asks me the same things. So I'm curious, Steve, what's your next question? Well, I have a list. <laughs> <laughs> but I, that's a it's a funny it's a funny thing you mentioned that because i i try to add in the usual mainstays because someone who's not familiar with you it may be the only time they hear from you so i try to squeeze those in and then i try to squeeze in i think most i think the more interesting questions come as follow-up questions to your answers so that's that's usually where the most I think informative and fun questions come out so you know this is what it is. I like how I'll you're counting out your questions. Normally, you yeah, so I'm about to ask Sorry. you a question you've probably been asked like a thousand times. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the safe yeah. ones. Yeah, so it's like you're hitting it right into my right into the right into the strike. Yeah, um, I got to start yeah, with so. you know, got to start off you know, you start off easy. What do you got? No, and I was curious uh, with your fantasy series all taking place in the same universe. How do you keep track of everything, or did you have it planned out? Do you have a big board with strings and? and paper clips and notepads and everything to keep track or how do you how do you track everything okay so you may have noticed that there's someone else talking that is echo stop <laughs> somehow you managed to trigger my automatic intelligence there what's up voice one more time you just ask that question <laughs> i was listening to that thing <laughs> okay something to do with it. Notebooks. I'll, I'll try not to trigger your, your echo again. Okay, so my question was about your fantasy series. It's in the same universe, and it's the many books in the series. How do you keep track of the different characters, the different plot lines, different histories, different backgrounds that the reader never sees, all the world building you do on the side? How do you keep track of it all? Okay. I was once asked this on a panel, and this was much earlier on, and I remember saying that I was jealous of George R. R. Martin because he has a wiki. And he literally has an army he can contact and ask him, did I ever use this character before? That was very nice. I actually have a wiki now, so that's disturbing. But I don't actually use it because I don't actually even know how to get into it. Uh, I just know it exists. How I do it is, uh, okay, this is going to be bad for those who are only listening. But by a raise of hands, how many people here know about Scrivener? Yeah. Oh, all three of you. Cool. Okay, so Scrivener, in for those who don't know, is... A writing tool it's most if you ever talk to any writer you say what do you use to write 90% of the time they're going to say what guys Scribner word word <laughs> everyone uses word which is not a writing tool it's a business tool yeah. but the fact of the matter is it is also the Latin of writing meaning that everyone uses it so if you're going to interact with an editor you're going to interact with an agent they all use word so everyone tends to default to word but Word is not a very good writing tool. Scrivener is. Now, in Scrivener, what you have is you can 
you basically have one folder that has your manuscript and then, then the rest of it is just research. Um, what I use it for is in the, the research, I, I basically throw away the, the research folder and I just fill that with separate folders that I have about my world. So I have characters, I have settings, I have countries, I have religions, I have monetary values. Literally everything I have ever invented goes into that research section. And it's hopefully highly organized. But what happens is when I finish writing a novel, I simply take the manuscript folder and I throw it away and I put a new manuscript folder in, but I keep all the research there. So everything that I've ever made is still there. I have just recently, <laughs> believe it or not, discovered that you can sort by ascending or descending order by letters. So I can put it in alphabetical order. Didn't know this for the longest time, believe it or not. So when I create a character, I literally have hundreds of characters. Now I can find them because I put them in alphabetical order, which is great. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that that file just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but it's always there. I never lose it. And anytime I need to look for something, boom, it's, it's right there. So I, 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 I didn't realize this beforehand and it would have been wonderful had I learned this from the very beginning so that this could have built up even more. So as a result of this, I have spent many, many hours doing nothing but puttering with my little world building, Scrivener file, adding characters, adding settings, doing research, inventing things I didn't even think I needed to, uh, but it's all in there. Now, another thing I end up having to do, believe it or not, is I actually have to reread my own stuff. Uh, the good news is, is that it's an audible. I don't know if you knew that, but I can literally sit, have a drink by the pool and listen through my books and I keep a notebook and for those of you who can't see, but these guys can, I have this little nice little handy dandy notebook where every time I hear something that is said that I went, oh crap, I forgot about that. I'll write that down to remind myself. So I keep refreshing my memory of what the hell it is I wrote. Also, if for some reason I cannot for the life of me remember something, or I don't know if I did or didn't do something, and this actually came up recently, uh, I can actually go on, there's a Discord site that's completely devoted to me. Uh, I believe it's called Ryra, and uh, this was made by other people, and they invited me. I don't think they thought I would actually come, but <laughs> I did, and I didn't leave, which I think is probably disturbing them to some degree. But they made me my own room. It says Ask Michael at the bottom, hmm. and uh, so anyone can come in and ask me a question. I usually respond to it, but they will argue about the most minute, ridiculous comments I mean, if you've ever seen like Galaxy Quest where the guy says, well, in episode 34, you, that's the kind of arguments they have. But the fact of the matter is, is that they will, the best part about it is that when they actually find a legitimate mistake I made, they will argue and rationalize why it wasn't a mistake. <laughs> and they will go, they will take the rationality to extreme lengths. So the thing of like, <laughs> Well, if you break down physics to the molecular level, it's possible. <laughs> I'm like, way to go, guys. But so if I have to, I can literally ask them a question and they will come back and they will give me usually, at least it will give me what the reader's response would be. And so i like, does this character have this ability? And they're like, I don't know. And they'll come back and they'll say, actually, in this year, it suggests they do. I'm like, okay, so that's, that's pretty much what my reader base understands. So I can work with that. Um, but yeah, so I, I keep track of everything because I keep it in lists. I keep it in my research folder. Knowing that you can keep trading out the manuscript and keep the research there is a huge benefit. I mean, like I will look up lists of names. I will have lists of architecture. I will have lists of plants and animals that I might need by region. It's all in there and I can get it at a fingertip. And then this is the best part, guys, in case you haven't noticed. There's this incredible invention. It's called the internet. <laughs> And you can look things up and it's amazing. <laughs> and I know you're laughing right now, but when I started writing, there wasn't an internet. So when I wanted to find out something, I had to go to the library. I was living in Northern Vermont at the time. It took an, uh, two and a half hours to get to the nearest library. That was tough. <laughs> so <laughs> count yourself lucky. I think that's Question. really interesting. Sorry, I was, I was going to just say, uh, I think it's really interesting that you can have a multi-pronged approach to your writing, Michael, insofar as you can be lying in bed one night, have an idea, and just stick it in your research and lore for some other time, you know, to kind of park it, 
rather than kind of oh I'll have, have to remember to write about that tomorrow in such a longer form but you can kind of have like almost like a like a library filing card to kind of say you know chronologically or otherwise that's that would happen in there and and you can kind of forget about it come back to it later and go ah i could use that so Girl. i'm not sure if this is the most exciting uh spin off of that but I'm using Scrivener for the first time right now um, for book two in the series I'm working on. I had no idea that it had this like almost like Google Drive like component, which mm -hmm. I, I mentioned Google Drive because that's what I currently use to keep track of all my world building nonsense and like ideas for you know the end game of the series and everything. What it, you said it's available for like the files are available with every manuscript, so you can like just like click into it um, regardless of the file you're working on. So as you understand, you've, you've seen it. Um, on the left hand side of the and the right hand side of the screen is a word processor, which is a very good word processor. And the left hand screen side of the screen is folders. Um, so how I set it up is you have the manuscript folder, which is obviously where the book is. Inside that you make another folder. That folder is your chapter. Inside that folder are documents. Each one of those documents right. is a scene. Very simple. Then you get down to the research folder, and you it's Wild West down there. You can do whatever you want. You can literally drag files from the Internet and drop them there. If you find something, you just drag it and drop it. and becomes part of your research. Mm -hmm. Or you can do what I do. I make a folder for characters. Inside that, I just make a bunch of documents, which are characters, and I write what I need in there. Uh, it doesn't come with it. You have to build it. Now, granted, I've been doing this for a decade, so my file is pretty extravagant. Uh, so much so that now when I save my files, it takes a while. It's I don't know how many billions of megabytes it is, but it's huge. <laughs> and I would be very upset if I lost it, so I do have to keep backing this up in random places just to make sure I never, you know, I don't get a ransomware saying, we're going to erase your computer. I'm like, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it in other places. Take the computer, I'll buy a new one. But the reality is, is that, yes, it's great in the respect that, and I mean, I could go on for hours and hours and hours talking about the various things, because what I actually have done is, Scrivener is a tool. It's not, it's not, you don't use it in a specific way. It's like you can use a, you know, a screwdriver to open a can. You don't have to use it to just do screws. So it same thing is true with Scrivener. But there are so many neat things that are hidden in it. And whenever I tell this to people who are unfamiliar with Scrivener, they just go agog that there is a name generator. That you can click on it and you can say, I want to look up Finnish names and Spanish names. I want to know the surnames and I want them female. You know, and, and it will generate those instantly. Wow. And if you don't like those, you click again and a whole new set will come up. So it's very convenient in that respect. This is what I'm saying, it's built for writers. And it can do all kinds of fun stuff like that. But yeah, it, it's you could go on and on and on for hours about that. But uh, I'm not sure I have even gotten close to answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I guess the, the only like the little thing I, I, I want to clarify is, do you have to recreate that whole like all the research, all the like character files, everything for every single manuscript? Or does it transfer over? No, what I'm saying is that I have a file. And in it, there is the manuscript that I'm writing. And then there's all the documentation that's the, that's the research. I simply take the manuscript, which is in a folder, and I delete that. And I, I start gotcha. a new one. So every, I'm still uh, in the okay. same file. That's what I'm saying. Gotcha. You never have to get rid of it. It's always there. So anything you've ever created will still be in the same file. Oh, very cool. Okay. I might get you of your little hmm. mini writing slip with the one card, you know. Another thing that's important is that I also keep all my books in there. Hmm. So what I do is I have a folder that says books. Inside that I have a series. Inside that I have all the books. The really inf wonderful thing about this is that if I want to look for, say, a name in a book, I click on it and I do a search on it. Fine. But what if I have no idea where this character was? I can click on the top of that branch, basically books, and I can do a search through everything I've ever written and it will find it for me which is really convenient when your wife comes to you and says, I think you misspelled this name. And I say, no, I didn't, honey. She's like, but in some of your books, you did. I can click on that, type that in, and when it goes, Bleep, meaning that it has found nothing, I'm like, this has never been in any book I've ever written, which is actually solves some arguments. <laughs> Scrivener sounds worth the, uh, worth the investment. Yeah. 
Next question. Do you avoid, because I know some authors avoid using things like Google Drive because they're afraid of pri there's privacy concerns or things like that. Do you avoid using some things? No, I, I uh, as far as I understand, uh, Google Drive is really good at collaborative uh, measures. It, it, I know uh, there are a couple of people uh, who have used it when they're working with another author. And because you can work with it live and both who can access the same document. And I've actually known some people, uh, Joe Conrath and uh, I forget his friend's name, did a television show recently. Um, they will be working on a book together and one person will write a sentence and as they're writing it, the other person is editing it behind them, which is like my worst nightmare. <laughs> So I would never want to do that. But uh, no, I, I, I don't avoid it because of the fact that it is unsecure. I simply have found, uh, I, I wrote most of my early books with Word because that's all I knew because I was working on a Windows machine. When I made enough money, I said to myself, I'm gonna get a Mac and I did. And so I got a very top of the line Mac and that's where Scrivener was king. So I got Scrivener and I was, I was unimpressed with it when it was ported to Windows, but uh, they've improved it. And then I've got it on Mac and I'm like, oh, this is even better. Mm -hmm. And once I learned, because you always see these pictures of people who have had Scrivener and they look beautiful. I'm like, is this just a time sink? Is this people just wasting time and not actually writing anything? They're just putting pretty pictures and stuff together. But actually it turns out uh, that it's not. Mm -hmm. I mean, so like I will write in the mornings, uh, from you know, like 6 a.m. until noon. Well, in the afternoon, sometimes I can actually just tinker with the file because it's not something I have to write. It's something I can just play with. Uh, and that's when I waste my time on that. But <laughs> those wasted times actually matter later on when you're trying to look for something and it's at your fingertips, it's much better. You'd also mentioned you, you've been writing since before the internet. So I wondered, you've been you've ta you've been on in in the industry for a long time. How has it changed? What are the for good and bad? What are the major changes you've seen over the years that you've noticed? Well, the major changes have been ebook, audiobook, and uh, now serialization seems to be popping up as something new. And Kickstarter. Those are the those are the major changes in the industry. Uh, when I first started writing, everything was pretty much print. In fact, it was print. Uh, my first publisher refused to do an ebook because they felt it was going to cannibalize their print. Uh, and we completely ignored them and we made an ebook anyway. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, we ended up getting the rights back from them anyway. Uh, but <clears throat> so that was the first revolutionary thing was ebooks, <clears throat> which was fascinating. And print on demand was also pretty big. Um, shortly after that, and, and so of course, as you understand, Ebooks became the big deal. All the publishers wanted the ebook rights because mm -hmm. that became a very lucrative part of their industry. In fact, it pretty much replaced what used to be the old mass market paperback, the little little things. Right. A lot of traditional publishers said, "Why do we need that if we have ebooks? It's, it's even cheaper, and you know, it's easier to distribute." So that re kind of replaced that, and they still obviously make mass market. But for for a lot of people, that's what they did as far as just you would have you know the trade paperback and the ebook, and that was it. Uh, then audio came out and for a long time the traditional publishers were not interested in audio uh, because I mean it was crazy audio books were for basically blind people and they cost a ridiculous amount of money and you put them on CDs it wasn't until of course that started to pick off and we had things like the you know the iPhones where you could put earbuds in and walk around and listen to it you could listen to your cars suddenly that took off and we didn't realize that until we were, I think it was Audio or, or Audible did a promotion where they would give you a dollar for every book you sold. We didn't even know about this. It was just like in the background. And one day we got this check and it was for like $10,000. And we we're like, whoa, this is interesting because I had sold my audio rights for my first books as a sub, uh, sub right to, uh, it went from Orbit to Audible or actually Orbit to recorded books to Audible. So we weren't making a lot of money off the audio because it was being subreddit out like that. But we managed to get a ridiculous, this this, this ridiculous check came in. I'm like, are we selling a lot in audiobooks? What the heck? And 
then as it went on, uh, it turns out that the audio publishers were willing to give us way more money than the traditional publisher was willing to give us for all our rights and all Audible wanted or all the recorded uh, uh, audio books. All they wanted was the audio rights. Mm -hmm. But they would give us twice as much as New York would give us for everything. And we went, huh, <laughs> that doesn't make a lot of sense. So why would I go with them? So this is one of the reasons why I ended up stopping with traditional publishing because I'm like, so I can, I can make twice as much in advance selling just the audio rights and I can keep the, the ebook and print rights myself. Wow. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I, I really can't afford to go with New York so much anymore. Uh, so we ended up selling our audio rights first, and then we would go to New York City. Do you still want it? And they did uh, for a while. And then I think someone in corporate in on high made a blanket decision. Because generally, you'll notice that in traditional, if one company does it, all of them will eventually do it. That was the thing with uh, the 30% uh, or 25% for ebooks across the board. And now they're then they started doing it with audio rights. That they, they have to have the audio rights. They're not going to sign you if you don't get print, audio, and ebook. Hmm. And we just... Well, I can just get the audio rights and sell that to one person. So that that was my traditional publishing is when I would go with an audio book. And then everything else I just keep myself, which is pretty much where I am now. Hmm. But, th but those are the major big ch Oh, and then the other one, of course, is Kickstarter. Uh, you may have heard of it. Uh, if you ever heard of the guy named Brandon Stanison, it may have popped up on your, 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 your radar there. But yeah, so we started that very early on. Uh, we had a fellow who, well, back in my early years, there were a number of authors who couldn't, uh, they would get like one or two books through a traditional publisher and then they didn't do well. So the publisher would not publish their last book, which is really kind of not only irked the author, but the fan base as well. So they would be like, what are we gonna do? And I said, well, I come from a traditional, you know, self-publishing background, I said, just self-publish it. And they're like, well, we can't afford it. You know, I'd have to, I'd have to hire an editor and a cover artist and we don't have the money for that. I said, well, kickstart it. And I go, no one knows who I am. They're not going to, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not doing well enough to get another, you know, book published through traditional. So how the hell am I going to get anyone to be interested in paying a kickstart? So, uh, unfortunately they said that to my wife and, and you never want to dare my wife. So <laughs> she went out and she took the one that we've established earlier, the one science fiction book that I wrote <laughs> who Orbit was not willing to publish. And she took that and uh, decided to kickstart it. And we were hoping, okay, so we, we, we estimated it would cost about $6,000 to do it right. And we were hoping, well, if, if Kickstarter gave us 3,000 and we put in 3,000, we could put the book out well. So we asked for 3,000. I think we got somewhere between 30 and 60,000. I forget exactly the oh, amount on that. Wow. And that's when we went, yeah, who knew? But the thing that was really shocking was that the vast, vast majority of the people who backed that Kickstarter had no idea who I was, hmm. mm. but they did now. And that opened this whole new pocket, this whole new vein of potential people. And that's one thing we discovered is that there are these different pockets of, of readers all over, and, and they, they congregate in different areas. They congregate on audiobooks. They congregate, you know, on Amazon. They congregate in, in uh, Kindle Unlimited or in Royal Road or on uh, Kickstarter. They're just like fandoms, essentially. And there was Kickstarter fandoms that they just love backing really cool projects. So in this attempt to get money or to prove that you could actually make money to produce a, produce a book, we opened up a whole door to new readers. And that was wonderful. So that's what we actually learned is that it's not just a means of financing the production of a book, but it's a means of getting new readers. And that was one of the big discoveries we made. Hmm. It's it's so interesting because I, I think of somebody like Zachary Gail, who I think a lot of people would consider to be one of the more successful self-pub fantasy authors around at the moment. But I think in terms of sales and about money he's made in terms of going through KDP or otherwise, like he's not rich off it or anything, but he put out a Kickstarter and a similar kind of idea of anonymous of his three books together, Michael. It was $130,000 kickstarter for somebody that wasn't really making you know and like that that's that's a mad concept that you know do an audiobook and doing all those other things and then all of a sudden you get an audience and a new audience as, as you've said put it all together and you've got something that's very uh, it's very profitable then you know 
Yeah, it's, it's often misunderstood. It, it, people are thinking that you're investing in something, but it, really it's, it's simply the concept of pre-orders. Yeah. People are pre-ordering the book, which makes it possible for the author to print the right number of books. So they're not overprinting the way a traditional publisher would do, because they have no idea. They will invest so much money, they print up a bunch of books, and then they can, sometimes they can't sell them all, which causes them all kinds of problems. But with a Kickstarter, they pre-buy the book you have the money already, you just produce the book and hand it out. And it, it, it's just a great way of doing the same process, only in a fashion in which an author can do it because they're not on the line for a huge amount of money because the money comes first and they already know that those sales are made. That's what makes it so uh, uh, attractive to most people. And like I said, I think that, that guy, that uh, Sanderson fellow, I think he picked up on it. He ran with it. He did all right. Yeah. He did all right. He's okay. He's all right. It was his first, It was like his second try. You know, it was like you know, <laughs> maybe in the future he'll do a little better. I'm curious, going off of all of that, um, where you see the industry generally going. If you have any predictions, and beyond that, do you think that more um, very successful traditionally published authors are going to look to self-publishing and Kickstarter, or do you think that's going to uh, you know, like you, Brandon Sanderson, you know, um, the handful that have done it are going to like kind of stay a handful. I have no idea why Brandon is still traditionally publishing. It makes no sense to me. Uh, he obviously has reasons. Um, but I mean, with the amount of money he made up the Kickstarter, he, he clearly proved that he doesn't have to. Now he may be doing it for convenience reasons. I've always assumed that Stephen King did it just because like, I mean, if I didn't have my wife, I might just go traditional just because, yeah, just take the manuscript and put it out there. I don't care. I mean, you're not looking for the money. You're just looking for it getting out. You're looking to, you know, feed your fan base because you like doing that. So that might be part of it. Uh, but he certainly doesn't need to do it for the money. Uh, he makes way more money doing it by Kickstarter because all that money is his. It's not being divided out in subsidiary rights. Um, one of the things I do see in recently that's kind of cool is the new interest in making high quality print books i don't know if you've noticed this but particularly in the self-published realm um, and some traditional publishers will go through like subterranean press and things that that started it but a lot of self-published authors are going the extra mile to make beautiful like leather or faux leather bound books that have sprayed edges and high quality, you know, like ribbons in it. And, and it just, they're just gorgeous books. And this is really appealing to the readers who like printed books. Uh, and that seems to be popping up a lot, which I find is fascinating. Um, but as far as the future of what people are going to be doing, it's really hard to say. Uh, I, I, this is a question should be asked of my wife. She's the one who knows all the stuff. She's, she's the guru of the business and she can tell where things are going. Right now she's investigating Royal Road as a new viable uh, discovery section because there's a whole, there, I mean, there's literally millions of readers in that area who, if you get noticed, will create a, a readership. Uh, and that's kind of unusual. Because right now, you may have heard of it, uh, there's the progression fantasy and RPG fantasy that is uh, very, very popular at this mm -hmm. present time because apparently people of your age have a tendency to remember having played games. And they like reading about it or watching it on Twitch. This appears to be a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very popular. But the traditional publishers won't touch it. They just seem to be either unable to understand it, they don't understand that you can make money at it, but people are making a ridiculous amount of money at it. Uh, so those sort of things do very well through uh, serial form. So things like Royal Road and others uh, can create an enormous amount. I mean, there's people just killing it doing that. Uh, they're, they're just putting it out for free. They have a Patreon account and people pay for it to get it you know, more. Or then they kick it off and they, they do an Amazon finished book out of it and people who didn't finish it on Royal Road will buy it there. So these are things that are just huge and I don't know where the future is necessarily going because I'm, I'm not smart like my wife. I just write books. Um, but I, I do notice that, that the 
the high quality books seem to be very popular right now, and I and I like that trend. I like people who are putting out a lot more effort because when first people first started traditionally public or self publishing, they they put out terrible terrible books. Now the quality of a tr of a self published book is exceeding that of a traditional publisher by quite a bit. They're doing a much better job, uh, so that's really cool. Then you also have the other problem, which of course is artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. which can cause all kinds of problems, particularly I feel for people in the uh, KU realm, because if a lot of the people in the KU are making a living by writing very quickly and not putting a lot of necessary, a lot of effort in making a really great book that's going to create a fan base, but they're just feeding into the, uh, the, the subscription model. And the problem with that is AI can do it much better and much faster. Right. So if one person is capable of writing a book a month, which many people are, hmm. you're going to have people who can do AI and they can write a book a day. And that's going to water that down. It could totally saturate that so that there's so many people in that pool that the amount of money people are making off of it could drop. That's where my real concern is for those, those writers. Hmm. Um, that that could just totally water that down and just like make it so there's no longer a viable way of making money. Which is why we would suggest going somewhat old school, which is like getting a, a, a readership and then taking that readership and getting the names uh, and the e email addresses and then selling yourself on a website so that if something happened to Amazon, if this did go bad, you could at least have a fan base that you could send out emails to have a new book out and you could make a living that way. But if you're completely locked in to the subscription model where people don't really know who you are, they're just buying whatever's there, that could be really bad if AI takes over. Mm. Mm. I know, I just brought you all down. That's all. <laughs> but I think some of the pick up, and there's a lot you've said there, Michael, that obviously we could pick apart on. The, the A couple of things I'll say. One about the deluxe books, Interestingly, a lot of those are rebuys for people as well. They're they're not they're not like oh. first time reads, if you know what I mean. So it's actually people wanting to invest in in series and books that they enjoyed in a much more you know, mostly with the intention of actually never reading that really lovely uh, version of the book to have sitting on the shelf and kind of use it as like a, a holder for memories, uh, or otherwise. But we, I think we've talked about this kind of over previous weeks, where the likes of Hollywood and big business are sort of becoming more and more risk averse, you know, in terms of, 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 of giving people a chance or taking chances on things. A bit like you said, risk lit RPG. And in doing so are sort of like forcing people down and forcing new creatives down an avenue where they never go near them at all. You know, they give them their chance and they kind of say, I'll do this by myself. And they'll miss that whole market essentially at a certain point. They'll pick up a couple, Travis Baldry, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and a couple of others, just uh, etc that are there that they've picked up but ultimately a lot of people are very happy with the decision to go self pub and stick for self pub going going down the road and make their own path and the own decisions for themselves so it's an interesting time i think i'm throwing it back to you steve <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i was uh i was how and if you if you picked up a book that you did, weren't sure who you didn't recognize the author's name do you feel like you could tell the difference between a a book that was written by AI and a book that was written by a person? Interesting you to say that. So I, I do know an author friend who purposely went out and tried to, and wrote a prompt <clears throat> to see how well it worked. And it's, it's very, very good. Hmm. Uh, now, he also obviously has some skill in writing a prompt. And he said, you know, write it in this style, write it with this point, and this is what I want you to do. Um, and it did come out, it, 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 it wasn't a matter of whether I could tell whether it was as good, say, as a written work. It was generally better. That's the scary hmm. part. Um, for the average uh, self-published author, it was significantly better. And, and it's just general prose. Now... It literally was a, a small portion. It wasn't a novel. So I have no idea how well it would do with a plot. And I don't know that it's even capable of doing that at this point. Everyone I know who's worked with it have said that basically they would do it in small small portions. That they would, you know, like a page or a paragraph or something. And they would have to just build it up that way. But So they're still creating the story. 
<clears throat> I don't think we're at a point at this time where AI can create an entire novel that's of any good quality. And, but, but it's going out and it's taking uh, as examples everything on the internet. So it's capable of regurgitating that which is already there, which unfortunately a lot of authors do already. <laughs> because there's so many authors who will read fantasy and try to recreate it and be like their idols instead of setting that aside and creating something completely different. That's much more unusual. Uh, most people, you know, I, I remember when I was first starting out, there was writers who would ask me for help and they would send me their stuff and I went, why, why is this so dark and miserable? Goes, well, I'm trying to do like, like George R. R. Martin. You know, I'm trying to give the, I'll make going, okay, but why? <laughs> Like, why would you want to redo him? I mean, be you. And and another fellow was writing a screenplay for a, a slasher movie. And I'm like, this is terrible. He goes, yeah, they're supposed to be. Uh, but what? I said, well, wouldn't you want to make the best ones? No, no, it, they're supposed to be crappy. And I'm like, I don't understand the mentality. But that's kind of the concept is that a lot of writers have a tendency to only read fantasy books and only read a certain kind of fantasy book and then they want to write one of those as opposed to say reading much more widely reading you know a variety of types of genres and concepts and then extrapolating from that something completely original they really do just regurgitate with it which is exactly what AI does which is why when I when I saw this I'm like yeah this is a lot like what I would imagine a real you know fast independent writer would be writing <clears throat> so that's why I consider this to be a really bad thing for your your KUs if if they're just churning them out very quickly. Now, obviously, there are people who don't do that. There's people who put some time and thought into it. Um, but there are some people who are, I know people who will put it out, you know, a book a month, a book, you know, like eight books a year. They're, they're doing this very quickly. Uh, and they're living book by book. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're doing it so fast. It's not like they're doing it for fun. They're doing it because that's what they have to do to make the money. Um, but if they're doing it in that fashion and AI can do it better and quicker, then yeah, that's that's scary for them. Yeah. You made a really interesting point there about, you know, and it's one I've heard before about, you know, reading widely uh, to find, you know, unique avenues into stories, you know, if we're talking about fantasy specifically, not to just you know, spew out the same old crap we've seen a thousand times. And I wonder, you know, I've personally have found nonfiction to be a huge source of inspiration when writing fantasy. And I'm curious for you, what do you go to? Like, do you, do you have, outside of the fantasy genre itself, where do you go for your inspiration, for your, you know, research, for anything um, as you're developing and writing new novels? Well, I rarely, rarely ever read fantasy. Uh, I read fantasy almost entirely because other fantasy authors have asked me to read their stuff <laughs> for one reason or another. I mean, I do have a lot of friends who are fantasy, and they will say, could you read this? Uh, but so for the most part, I, I, I generally do read nonfiction, um, historical, not surprising. But I will also read um, anything that is generally different. Like, I, I famously sort of famously for those of you who have actually read my stuff. Uh, there's one book in which I called Death of Dulgath that I wrote and I chronologized as I went through it how I wrote it so that I could give you a behind the scenes look of how I went about it. And the first step of that was uh, my wife said you have to do this in, in very quick time because of the contract. I had to get it out before the contract took effect. So I, I wrote it in 68 days. It's one of the faster books I wrote since the very early days. Um, but the very first thing I did was the idea. I didn't have an idea. And what I was doing is I was watching uh, Tom Cruise in the movie Jack Reacher. Mm. And it's not usually what you would think to be as source material for a high fantasy novel. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great because what I thought of was I was instantly invested in this storyline from the very first scene. Yeah. And I went, that's the kind of fantasy novel I want to write. I want to write a fantasy novel that has a thriller pace that grips you instantly from the very first moment and then just keeps dragging you along with these ongoing manipulations that are just constantly saying you have to read. Uh, so that's that's a good example. It's not even a written thing. That's actually, you know, it's just a movie. That I went, this is, this is a good source of how I can take that genre and put it in this genre and make something different. 
But for the most part, I mean, a lot of my, I mean, and, I, and I read classics. I, I like I said, uh, I didn't send it to you. I'm getting my interviews mixed up now. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I read classics in the in the summer. I always pick a, a classic to read every summer. This happens to be a passage to India, but. I find something interesting in all of these that I can constantly add to my writing, but I, I generally don't read fantasy because it's too close to what I write. Yeah. It's too, you know, meta. I'm not going to get involved in that, and it's just going to, like, oh, crap, someone else thought of that. Now I can't use it. You know, you don't want to do that. It's almost like reading fan fiction. It's like same thing. It's like you, you don't want to go near that because it could influence you in some way. Uh, so, but, I mean, I tend to read, I, I have a great uh, Susan... Uh, Weiss Bauer is great. She has a great series of history books that the reason I love it is because I always like a broad history, like starting at the beginning of time, going all the way through. She has three of them. And it's the only history books I have ever read in my life that had me laughing out loud. <laughs> she does amazing things with footnotes. I mean, she's talking about how the Sathians are just horrible people. They have face plain and they're, they're, they're eating the blood of their friends and stuff like this. And they were always high on pot. <laughs> and just was like, that completely demolishes the idea that if you smoke pot, you're passive. <laughs> <laughs> it just, I mean, she comes up with some really great stuff that are fascinating. But those are great ideas. And you can always, and the best thing about nonfiction is you can steal from it blatantly and no one cares. So that's always fun. <laughs> and you had mentioned, uh, well, with, with AI specifically, how, how does it concern you in general? And, how far off do you think we are for AI to be capable of writing a whole novel and nobody know the difference? I think we're still quite a ways away from that um, because it's just going to pretty much take what's out there and redo it. Now, like I said, there's a lot of authors that are doing that. So, yes, that is a possibility. Uh, and if you're not a discerning reader, because there's, there's a lot of people who just love reading, it doesn't really matter how good the quality of the writing is. It's just something for them to read. So that let's, that's my concern. That's going to dilute that pile. Uh, right now, I think the, the primary use of AI is, it does actually serve some really good purposes for writers. I, I, my wife has been using it, which is annoying to me. Uh, <laughs> she'll say, how could you write this sentence better? <laughs> like, hey. <laughs> but, you know, it's kind of annoying. Uh, but it does work really well if you're looking for a word and you can't figure it out. You can just ask it a more specific question than you could just by looking at a thesaurus. Uh, so it does help in those respects, or if, if you're really having a struggling time with a specific sentence, you can say, how, how could this be done a little bit better? And it will give you some suggestions, which, which does get you over uh, some humps. So it's, in that respect, it's, it's not much different than a, you know, a spelling correction thing. It just helps you with grammar. It helps you with other things. Uh, but as far as it actually making a, a great novel, I think that's probably quite some ways off at this point. Uh, but it certainly will help writers to be able to uh, write a little bit better, a little bit faster. But the real concern is that people will exploit the concept and use it to just write bad novels. And it will be, uh, you know, competing with other bad novels. <laughs> yeah. You had also mentioned um, about having your own website and a mailing list and a way to, to be in contact with your reader base without having someone in between for someone who's just starting out, how would that person, how would they, how would you, what would you give them? What tips would you give them to create that following, to create that reader base, to get their name out there without having to depend on Amazon or social media too much to where they can have that, that list of emails, they can have direct contact. But how would you go about that? If you were starting out now? Um, uh, well, it's, it's pretty much the same way I always did it. <laughs> And I, I once wrote a blog post on this, which is the answer that no one wants to hear because everyone assumes that there's a secret that you can do that will promote that and that there isn't one. Uh, I just, it, the, the blog post was entitled Building a Beach One Grain of Sand at a Time. Mm -hmm. What I did was I wrote books and then I handed them to people one at a time and I asked them, please, if whether you like it or not, leave leave a review. Anywhere. Goodreads, Amazon, whatever you want. That's it. And I did this over and over. I went, I did signings at bookstores. I handed it to friends. 
I went to readers groups literally everywhere I could, conventions, handed it out. I had one person at a convention look at my book and they said, all right, I'll buy this. And I said, oh, really? What was it that convinced you? Was it was my poetic prose? Was it my insight? Was it the, 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 the plot? What was it? And they said, I read three pages and there wasn't a single misspelling. <laughs> big bar, big high bar. Uh, so, you know, and I literally did this over and over and over. And every single time I went to Amazon or I went to Goodreads, I would see the names of people I handed books to who did a review. They usually, they usually liked it. But one day, someone left a review who I had never talked to, who I had never given a book to. And I went, uh-oh, it's starting to happen. So the key here, and my wife would tell you this, the key to being successful at writing is number one in the most important thing you have to do is write a really good book. And this, I feel, is the most overlooked <laughs> aspect of Because people will write a book and it won't sell and they'll say, I don't understand, what am I doing wrong? Am I not promoting it enough? Do I not have enough interviews? Do I not have enough, well, what am I doing wrong? I'm like, your book sucks, okay? Let's face it, it's awful. Get another hobby. You're not good at it. <laughs> no one tells you that though because they're all very supportive. But that's usually the case. When your book is good, you don't need a lot of promotion mm -hmm. because other people will promote it. And there's an old thing that if you get, let's say, I don't know, 10 people to read the book, maybe three of those people will then tell other people to read the book. If you get 100 people to read the book, you'll get one person who really, really loves the book and will start to tell other people a lot and will make it a point to get them to read the book. If you get a thousand people to read your book, you'll get something called a super fan who believes it's their life's calling <laughs> to make sure that everyone else on the planet reads you and considers you the best author in the world. Those are the ones you want because you don't pay them, but they will be the best ambassadors to readers in your entire life. So it's literally one grain of sand at a time. You hand people books until finally they start handing it to other people. If you wrote a good enough book and you put it into enough people's hands, they will start to suggest it to others. That's the best way. It's, in my opinion, it's like the only way, unless there is another way. If you were to manage to get a major publisher to believe that you're the next best thing, they will push it so hard that even a really crappy book can sell. In fact, there are some, there's been at least one situation where they printed the book with New York Times bestselling author before the book came out because they also bought enough books to make sure that happened. Now, that is going above and beyond, but for the average author, that's a little out of reach. So write a really good book and then use social media. Social media is the most best ROI you can get. You can get so much more bang for your time. If you go to conventions, you do anything else, you're not gonna hit that many people. But if you go on any major site, Reddit, you go on Discord, you go on Goodreads. Goodreads is huge, it's, it's the place where most readers go. Uh, if you go to these places and you promote your book without promoting it. I mean, you don't actually want to go buy my book. That's a really bad way of doing it. You want to become part of the community and you want people to discover you're a writer and then they will support you. Uh, and if you do that, then if you have a good book, they will start talking to others and it'll start picking up. But yeah, it's, it's, it's not a matter of a method or a technique or any kind of marketing that's really going to work for you. Uh, it really is for the long run. I mean, you can have you can run ads and it might boost you for a while, but if you really want to have a long run where you can write five, ten novels and live off that for the rest of your life, you have to write good books. You have to get into a handful of people, and those people have to be able to spread the word. And by the way, when I say a good book, the definition of a good book is very simple. It's the kind of book that when one person reads it, they want to tell other people to read that book or give that book to them. That's the definition of a good book. It's not how much it sells necessarily. It's not how good of reviews you got. It's not how many awards you got. It's if a person reads it and they give it to others and say, you have to read this book because it's great. That's a good book. Great advice. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm sure it's not the answer most people would want to hear, but it's, yeah. No, because it's hard <laughs> yeah. as hell. And it yeah. takes forever. Yeah. I think, yeah, one of the 
big things that I, I knew going in, but it's definitely been like hammered home. I mean, it's only been a few, like three, a little over three months now since my uh, book came out, but it, you just have to be patient. And you know, and it's gratifying, you know, it may be, you know, months later, but seeing the reviews start to come in, seeing people actually start to respond, you know, you're an unknown quantity and you just have to give them the chance. And like you said, if it's a good book, if it attracts, you know, if people like it, oh. they will talk about it and they will go out of their way to review it and tell people about it. And Something else you should obviously keep in mind. Number one, interact with your readers. Uh, show them that you care about their opinions and their thoughts. Let them, you know, tell them thank you because they're the ones paying your bills. So it's appropriate. <laughs> yeah. uh, the other thing is that if anyone gives you a bad review, uh, do one of two things. Either do not respond <laughs> at all. The other is to thank them for giving a review at all. That will usually show that you can take being ridiculed and that you're not an asshole. But if you come out and you attack them, if you get defensive, that's pretty much signing a death warrant to your entire career. Hmm. So don't do that. Hmm. Great advice. Uh, do you, what are your feelings on, on responding to positive reviews? Because I know some, some people are of the mind that you should never respond at all, no matter what the review says. It should, you should stay in your lane and not, not get in this lane. What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, let's see. Uh, I, I initially I didn't really respond to reviews one way or the other. And when you say good review, that's somewhat subjective. Yeah. Um, I've had reviews that totally trashed my books that were good reviews, and I've had books uh, reviews that just lauded my books that were awful reviews. Uh, uh, just because of how they wrote it. I mean, if someone comes back and said, "Oh, I loved your books." and it's for all the wrong reasons, it's kind of demoralizing. <laughs> and if someone comes back and it has really good critical analysis and they didn't like it, I'm like, okay, yeah, that's actually a really good review. I'm not happy with it, but yeah, you did a good job. <laughs> so that kind of response is fine. I mean, if you can separate your ego from what the person's doing, that's totally understandable. If you can understand that people, I mean, there are some people out there who are just purposely um, attack people for the purpose of making a splash and getting, you know, getting likes or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, you have to deal with those, but those ones just stay away from. Uh, my wife would often like comments on things where she would say, you know, thanks for making a review at all, just because, you know, that was good. And, and it usually worked well. And oftentimes people would have specific reasons they didn't like my books. And I could go on and say, you know, um, okay, good point. But there was this and this and this. I didn't know if you noticed. And they were, oh, you know, I didn't notice that. No, oh, thank you for, and you, if you're kind and considerate and don't take offense, you can really turn someone around. And I've, had, I've done that many, many, many times mm -hmm. where if you treat people not like, oh, you jerk, and you come back and say, okay, good point, but I just wanted to point this out. Is that okay? And, and if you're nice to them, they'll, they'll like understand it. Like, oh, I didn't even know you'd see this. Oh, crap. <laughs> and, and, and it's all okay. But you can actually turn bad reviews into good reviews pretty quickly. It was one thing we did one time back when I had an advertising agency when uh, I was doing ads and I did a really bad thing. I put the wrong phone number at the bottom of the ad. $20,000 ad mm. and they had the wrong phone number. Yeah. So what we did was we bought the phone number and rerouted ah. it. And so when the client found out and they're like, it's the wrong phone number. I said, yeah, but it's still going to come to you. <laughs> and because we did that, because we made the mistake and we took the effort, they became like a client for life. And that's the same kind of deal. If you don't, if you own up to the mistakes you made and try to be better and, and let people know that you're not hiding that these things and you, you just treat people well, <laughs> it, it comes through as authentic and you'll be, you know, you, you'll be someone who people will will want to follow. I, I've had people who have supported Kickstarters of mine who have never read mm -hmm. me just because they've seen me doing stuff like this because mm -hmm. they like the person I am or they like the mission I'm on or they like why I write rather than what I write. It doesn't matter to them what I'm writing. They like the fact that I'm writing for this reason. And 
my wife has a big thing where she uh, is a guy named uh, something Sinek, I forget his name. He did a, a, a talk, TED Talk, in which he explains that it's not what you're doing. In other words, if you made a washing machine that did a great job, uh, you don't tell people you made a great washing machine. You tell them why you made the washing machine. And when you tell them why you do something, they get on board with that. Uh, Apple is a huge example of this. They don't. They, they they get you behind the whole concept of it, not just the product itself. And I I found that this is quite true. I mean, my my whole reasoning when I was writing my books was I wanted to write something that didn't exist. And I explained why I didn't think that the books I wrote existed. I mean, my books are fast paced. They're humorous. They're not silly. Uh, and they are written in contemporary American language, uh, which is something I can't find, and I still can't find, which is really mm. obnoxious, because I wish I, I wish people would imitate me to some degree that I could actually enjoy reading some <laughs> of the books. Um, but that's what I was looking for, and so I wrote that. And it's so funny, because people say, oh, he's just writing the same old stuff that was written back in the 70s. I'm like, none of this was ever written this way before. So that's my why because I wanted to read these types of stories and I wasn't finding them and a lot of people responded to that and they they agree and when you get people to agree with your mission they're a lot more lenient even if you don't do that great of a job because they're like yes I'm rooting for you because you have a great vision of the of what I want to see happen as well hmm. so going off your why why you write why do you continue to write in the Rayera universe? What, what motivates you to constantly come back and explore more of the history, you know, to flesh it out more, to explore new characters, rather than, you know, a lot of authors go and decide, you know, they get bored, you know, they jump around, they create new universes. So what, for you, brings you back for more? I have a very threatening wife. <laughs> <laughs> So Tell when I finished it. the first original six books, <laughs> I was done. I wasn't going to write anymore, and, and certainly not in this universe, and certainly probably not in fantasy, because like I said, I had, well, I actually did. Uh, I wrote 13 novels before the first one got published. Almost none of them were fantasy. I, like I said, wrote fantasy, I wrote science fiction, horror, anything you can think of. And fantasy was the last thing I was planning on writing. Um, but because it resounded so well, it was selling fairly well, and because my wife fell in love with the characters, she was very upset. And she, we were, we were going to lunch one day, and she said to me, she goes, this really is awful. And I said, what? She goes, you can go off and have fun with those characters anytime you want, because they live in your head, but I can't. And I'm like, this is weird. <laughs> this is a really weird thing. I'm like, my, my wife has a crush on one of my characters. And I'm like, she's having an affair behind my back. <laughs> so... You know, she wanted more, and um, so because I love her, I wrote some more books on the topic. Um, and those were meant to be just one-offs, which is the chronicles. I just was going to write, and I wasn't going to don't plan to have any more of these. But I, I'm doing this because my wife really wants some more. Also, because people had made accusations that this could that the the Raya revelations could never have happened. These two characters could never have found themselves and never gotten along. I'm like, okay, so I have to. All right. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the challenge of that was part of it. But then, um, obviously, everyone wanted a new series from me. And I could have gone with something completely different, and I considered it. But there was a problem. When I wrote my original series, I gave a backstory to the world and how it all came about and how the Empire came into existence. And it was a complete and total lie. And I knew it when I wrote it. Uh, in fact, I sent it to a friend. He's like, this is the sappiest backstory <laughs> I've ever seen. I said, yeah. I said, because it's not true. It's, it's what would have happened over 3,000 years. You know, you, you, you read about like Greek myths. They're not telling you what literally happened at the Battle of Troy. This is something that's been altered into a romantic right. form. So when I talk about this guy who's... You know, betrays his own people for the love of a woman. And you're like, yeah, that's not really what happened. So I felt obligated to actually tell the real story because they didn't want people thinking, as my friend did, that this was this. What's what I thought the actual backstory was. But that required me to write three books, and I'm using 
<laughs> visible quotes for people online or in, in audio to let you know that that's not what it became. But I intended to write three books um, in which I explained the, the history of the first empire. The problem was um, I assumed everyone would have read my first mm. series. So they know how it turns out. So I could write those first three books to get to the point where you see how things are going to work out and that would be enough. And then it hit me. And everyone's starting there. They're starting with this one. This is chronologically further back in time. And I went, oh crap, I can't end it without telling them how the war turns out. That would be really bad. I'm like, oh crap. So I've got to write three more books. Now imagine if you're a writer, and I'm assuming a lot of you are, um, if you write a novel, a series of books in which you plan this perfect story arc to complete in three books. It's gorgeous. It's going to end just right. And then you realize you got to write three more. Like, oh crap. Okay, this is not cool. So I had to build three more and build a whole new story arc. So that's what I ended up having to do with that. Uh, yeah, it, it was it was sort of a pain. And, and, and unfortunately, I did it again. I completely <laughs> lost track of the question that was asked of me. <laughs> Carl, you asked the question. What was it? Do you remember? Oh, it was just why do you keep uh, returning to the right ear? Oh, universe? right. What so that's why I did that. I went back and I had to explain that. And then, obviously, I had this 3,000-year-old history on this side. And then I had, so basically, I had the Middle Ages. And I had the Bronze area with the, the Battle of Troy and Homer. I needed to connect them. Hmm. And I'm like, if I could just write the connection point, I'll have this really cool, huge, long storyline. So it was kind of a no-brainer. So I had to come up with like the Roman period. So in that time, I went with three books. And that I stole from Isaac Asimov. Hmm. Because if you ever read Foundation, he writes this huge length of stories in the Foundation in which he has a story, then he jumps ahead in time, and you see how that affected this time, and then you jump ahead in time. And I went, what a great way of doing it. So I could tell the entire like thousand years in three books based off of three people's lives based in three separate very important parts of history. So that's how I connected them. And then I was done. I assume. <laughs> and we and a lot of people were not happy with the fact that that's not enough. So now I have the famous and I don't know if you guys follow me at all, but there's the famous exploratory commission to see if there is something I can do. Uh, beyond that because I I vowed never to go beyond by your revelations because it ended so perfectly. Uh, and I told everyone I can never write beyond that because it ended so wonderfully, unless, of course, I were to go back 3,000 years and write the beginning of the world and then connect the two of them together and had an ongoing larger story arc that I could then extend beyond the final one. If I were to do that, it's possible. And, of course, that's kind of what I ended up doing. So it's possible. But the problem with that is I have, I don't know, two, three million words uh, of a lot of stories and characters and events and for me I have to use all of them and make them all tie together as if I had planned it from the very beginning <laughs> that's a tall order you're saying how do I keep track of it I not just have to keep track of it I have to work them all together to make them all make sense as if the whole thing worked from the beginning and as you know I have to write the whole thing first in this case, not only do I have to write what might be a final series, but I also write other books in between to set up that final series to add the foundational aspects. So I'm looking at writing eight, ten novels before I publish anything else. Yeah. Wow. That's why it gets really... Unpl and when I just think about it, it makes my head hurt. <laughs> uh, but that's what I'm working on to see the viability of can I do it? And if I can do it well enough, because I don't want to have what's happened to me in other movies where you have this great beloved movie and they have, and then they add a sequel and you go, okay, that just ruined the whole thing for me. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now I can never read the original because I have that. So I don't want to do that. So that's where I am. Long answer to a short question. No, great answer though. Yeah. Another reason why I should never start writing. Uh, oh, this just seems like an absolute stress ball of, of magnitudes which I can't even conceive of. Oh, don't ever start writing because <laughs> it is the worst job ever. First of all, you're your own boss. You keep whatever hours you want. 
Uh, you can do whatever you like. Uh, you pay you an enormous amount of money. No one's life is on the line. You can't harm anyone. And as, in addition to all that, people will write you daily and say, oh, my God, I'm sorry for interrupting you. I know this is a huge inconvenience. Please apo- I want to apologize. I'm so sorry. But I just wanted to write to tell you that I think you're the greatest person who's ever existed. <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> Don't be a writer. It's just like tarring roofs or, you know, like yeah. Nashville. Yes. Same thing. <laughs> I feel your pain. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. you feel my pain. <laughs> Nine or ten, huh? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow, was there... And it wouldn't be a big deal if I was Brandon Sanderson. And I don't mean that because he writes fast. Because he, I mean, he writes big. But he is the same age right now that I was when I started. Right. Uh... And he's now looking at getting other authors to take over his Cosmere hmm. uh, because he doesn't think he can finish all the books that he has planned. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm turning 62 in a few days, and I'm like, I don't know if I can continue getting all these books done. And the worst thing I could think of would be get part way and end up like Robert Jordan and leave everyone, mm-hmm. you know, and I won't want to do that. So what would happen in that case? The books would never get published. So I could spend 10 years and have nothing to show for it, which would be bad. Again, more pressure. Not to mention, I don't even get to write what I was planning on writing, which is like, you know, science fiction and other genres that I think would be really cool. (laughs) Never got into those. Not allowed. The boss says no. Yeah. (laughs) So what, if you were to write more science fiction, what specific subgenre like are there specific ones you know space opera you know near future what what interests you uh well the one i did write uh was born from the concept I, I tend to write more traditional science fiction rather than space opera uh the one that i was writing was kind of uh i had a bunch of people well i wrote i read uh, brave new world and in we read it not that long ago and it was part of a reader's uh, writer, a reading group. And the weird thing was that it was supposed to be a dystopian future. But the modern reader is like, that's not such a bad future. It's not horrible. I'm not sure what he was upset about. Uh, and I started thinking about that. It was kind of weird. And, and then I started talking with like my, my family who were older than I am. And they were of the opinion that like, the past was great, the present is awful, and the future is going to be worse. And I went, what a very pessimistic, awful view. And the old science fiction always saw the future as usually being better, not necessarily negative. So it started making me wonder, what would happen if someone from present day went into the future and they found that the future had solved all the problems that we have today, all the things that we would think you'd want, like, like no more war, no more sexism, no more racism, no more class problems, no problems with finances, no rich and poor, uh, no differences to have to be concerned about, no one has to work. All of those things would be solved. But to do that, what would you sacrifice? What would need to be sacrificed? And what would a person from present day think about that? For a good example, let's say in order to get war, you had to get rid of countries. Mm-hmm. What about a person who's very patriotic? They could find that as a huge negative. What if you had to get rid of religion? Would that be something that people would be on board with? So it just would be interesting to say, if we were to give you the future everyone says they want, would you see it as a utopia or a dystopia? Mm-hmm. So this became a Roychat test that I was creating. And I tried to do it as balanced as I could. And I took a person from present day and threw him into the, you know, several uh, years in the future in which all this happened. And I explained how it happened and how it worked out. And it's interesting that when people read that book, I get such a total spectrum of responses because so many people will look at it and say, that is a horrible future. And other people are like, I want to live there. That is my dream world. So it's just fascinating that when people read that book, it tells me a lot more about who they are rather than what my book's about. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what interests me in science fiction. And I, I wrote several really good science fiction novels that I would probably want to revisit that were kind of cool uh, and, and try and rebuild some of those. But it just, there's just some really cool ideas I've had, I've come up with, because science fiction is a great place to just like play with really cool, nifty ideas, because you can take the real world and extrapolate from it. Whereas in fantasy, you can't do that. I can't use 
uh, common relations. Like I can't talk about, yeah, he, he was as, you know, as, as, as fast as a bullet. You can't do that because that's something everyone knows about but doesn't work in a fantasy book. So you can't do that. And, and I'm really good at that sort of wild relationship pattern thing when I'm doing descriptions, but I can't use that in a fantasy unless I build the fantasy world first and then I can relate to what I've already created, but it's not as much fun because you don't get the common uh, the common thought that you can pull off. Uh, but now the other downside to this, of course, is the fact that I realize I'm getting too old and my personal experience doesn't relate as well with the mainstream reader. Hmm. So if I'm pulling references to All in the Family, people are going, what? So <laughs> it's like, okay. So maybe maybe staying in fantasy might be okay. It might might be because it's timeless. Mm. And I remember Stephen King was saying that it that uh, there were these great writers who did sold millions of copies of their books in the eighteen hundreds, but no one knows who they are anymore. Uh, although you know who Peter Pan is and you know who Alice That's in Wonderland true. is, uh, and Wizard of Oz. These are things that people because it's timeless. You can read them today just as well as back then. It doesn't matter. But you can't read a book that was written in the nineteen sixties because it's out of date now and it seems weird. So yeah. There's a certain benefit. I mean, I did a lot of things by accident. I accidentally didn't put profanity in my books. I accidentally didn't put a lot of sex or, or graphic violence in my books. I did it just because it didn't help me with the plot. And uh, I happened to write in fantasy. Hmm. And all those things made my audience be everything from like 11-year-olds to 90-year-olds. And I also, uh, you know, I'm, it doesn't matter what year we're in. It, it will still work. So there's that. So if you're going to screw up, screw up like I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good way to screw up. Good yeah. advice. <laughs> Very good. For for authors who are who are signing contracts or um, who are, have a, a book deal that they're considering, what would you recommend they look out for? As far as specifically <laughs> rights, just rights for the future, because you had mentioned that earlier. Um, yeah, that would be one that if my wife was here, you'd be here for hours. Uh, the, the one that she has a tendency to look out for most for is, uh, um, uh, shoot, what is it? I can't draw it to the top of my head. She yelled at her. Hey, Robin, can you hear me? What should they look out for in contracts? <laughs> she says that's not an easy question. What's the number one you hate most? The number one thing you hate most, <laughs> non-compete. That's what okay. I'm trying to think of. <laughs> the non-compete, the non-compete in, in, in a, it, you can literally ruin uh, an author's career. Mm -hmm. Because if you state, it can state it in, in a contract that says, um, if you, you, you cannot produce any other book that might compete with the book that you sold them. And there's no description of why or what the classification is. So literally anything you write could technically be uh, in competition with that. Um, now the problem is uh, it's completely illegal because all contracts with major publishers are in New York and the New York law basically states that you have a right to work. And a right to work means you, when you do a non-compete, it has to be small in focus and in time. Uh, so if you had a job uh, in some industry and you were to go to another company, you, they wouldn't want you to bring that information to them. So they might say you can't do that for two years and it's about this specific thing that you know about. Um, but literally the way it's written in most contracts, the non-compete and it's like in every contract that's out there, uh, it states that you simply cannot write anything that could compete with your previous work without saying what that is. No one has ever taken them to court. They have used this, I think, in some instances to put pressure on people to not like self-publish, mm -hmm. not do ebooks, not to. Uh, in fact, there are certain people, certain authors I know who have gone and been afraid to, you know, write in the same genre for fear that would be more, you know, directly to that. Uh, and that's very bad. So, but you can get that out, and every agent you talk to will say, "Oh no, that's standard. You, you, you'll never get that out." We did. And uh, it was interesting because I, I sold my books to Orbit and they were very slow to negotiate. And as a result, they had edited the book, done cover art for the book, had the book almost all ready to go, and we still hadn't signed a contract. And I said, well, 
and because I was doing so well self-publishing, I didn't care, and they didn't believe that I would walk, but I let them know, yes, I will definitely walk unless you change this clause. And so they were able to define what competition meant, which was uh, you have to have, you know, like I forget what it was, more than 5% of the same words. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, it had to be like 89% you know, of the same words in that new piece would be in competition. I'm like, oh, I can live with that. <laughs> like, yes, we can do that. And it was funny because later on, another author who went from, so, uh, who, who was a traditional published author, he, he, he's like, I don't know what Sullivan's talking about. I, it was easy to get that. And he got the exact same thing, worded exactly the same way that I did. So I was like, yes, we did that for you. And he's like, oh. <laughs> But that, that's probably the number one is to watch out for non-compete. Um, and if you're, that, that's if you're getting a traditionally published uh, contract. If you're doing something else with say an audio publisher, you should expect it to only pertain to the audio, uh, not to anything else. There are a number of people now who are trying to uh, snatch up a lot of rights mm -hmm. and when they don't need to because they're only producing the audio, but they also want to do the other stuff. And if they do the ebook, I mean, you can do that just as easily as they can. So they're not bringing you anything. So you should only sign away rights that you yourself cannot leverage. If it's something that you can do, don't give it to them. Now, if you're going to go with traditional and you understand that you're giving up all your rights for the your entire life plus 70 years, yeah, then you can do that. But you're going to be giving that up. And I did that knowing that I didn't care because I was going to write more books. And I was going to use that. That money that I gave up for those books was meant to make me a traditionally published author, open a lot of doors, get me a bigger fan base, which it did. Then I made money off of self-publishing later books. This was a calculated decision I made. But if you're a young author and you don't know what you're doing, uh, make sure that you're, you're, you're not being sucked in by having them take rights that they don't need. Don't give them anything that they're not going to leverage. In other words, if, if you're going with the print publisher and you know if it's a small print publisher, don't give them your audio rights. Keep that, use it, but you have to use it. I mean, don't, don't keep it if you're not going to use it, that would be dumb. Uh, keep your ebook rights and then make an ebook and that way you'll get the direct cost of it. So, but there's a lot of things in there. And if you really want to do that, you're going to have to watch a video with my wife because she's, she literally is a freaking expert in this. She's talked to lawyers. She's, she's a legend, as they say in the industry, as far as that's concerned. But, just, you know, Robin Sullivan, wife of Michael J. Sullivan, you'll find a whole bunch. Yes. And when you, when you do finish a book, do you have a celebratory drink or do you have a, do you go out and celebrate in some way when you do finish a book? Um, not usually. Uh, my wife does. When she finishes editing one of my books, we will then like jump in the car and go to Virginia Beach mm. where we will spend a weekend. Um, but no, I, I, I tend to finish a book and move on to the next. It's, it's, it used, I mean, when I, when I finished the first series, I was very, very excited. It was great. And uh, I, I, I just like, you know, fist pumped and walked around the house and I was all alone. <laughs> and I was just yeah. depressed because I knew never, no one was ever going to read that book. So that was depressing. So no, celebratory things, nah, I don't, I don't usually manage that. Because you know what? I hate to say it, but literally every day I celebrate. I, mean, <laughs> I have I have happy hour cocktail at 5 o'clock just about every day. So, and I hang out at the pool, listen to great tunes, and, and yeah. And I have people who drop by who are just boondocking, and they just hang out, and we, we do have fun. Nice. So. Yeah, every day I live in a wonderful world and this imaginary world, it's a fantasy, but then again, that's what I write about. Sounds fitting. What's your favorite cocktail? Right now, an old fashioned, oh, nice. but it has to be made right. Uh, I have uh, I have gotten into cocktails recently. I study their history and how to make most of them. And uh, if you do the old fashioned just right, it's a really good cocktail. Now recently, I went to a number of very nice restaurants and I ordered the cocktail, I ordered the old fashioned, and one person, amazing, mm -hmm. exactly right, perfect. The giant ice cube, the large, thick slice of orange, the bitters, it was perfect. And it came out with a nice cinnamon color um, with a Luxardo ch cherry, that was very important. But, then went to a nice restaurant, 
No, it was like muddy brown and with like shaved ice. I'm like, what are you thinking? Shaved oh, no. ice. <laughs> yeah. What? No, it was just sad. Uh, but yeah, you know, yeah. Right now, yeah, I would say the the old fashioned is probably my favorite. Although I do make a pretty damn good Jimmy Buffett tribute margarita, which was you know important. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, that makes me curious what if any of your hobbies have made their way into your books well a lot of them um people have often asked me like how do you know about the stuff as i close i did it uh first of all people <laughs> wonder how i know so much about horses and horseback riding because i used to own a horse when i was younger and i used to mm-hmm. ride it all over the place uh i used to go used to go get milk at the grocery store I mean, think about that uh, they actually had a little like, hitching post, and they couldn't believe because it was decorative. But they were like, "What the heck? There's a horse!" Um, <laughs> I also, am an illustrator, and I uh, started uh, my one of my first college courses because uh, I had a scholarship to an art school was uh, oil painting, and uh, they were teaching terrible stuff. Hmm. And but there was an old man in the back of the room who just shared the space. And he was like a, an old master. He was amazing. And I just sat next to him and he taught me how to do oil painting in the old fashioned style of the masters. So when I was writing a, a book, um, the Dugath, as a matter of fact, there was, an, there was a painter doing a portrait. And I was able to discuss in great detail what he was using. So I always like to inform readers as well as entertainment with fantasy. It's like, oh, well, it's just a fantasy world. But I actually like to use real life things like how you dye cloth, how you card wool how you uh you know create forge a sword these are things i actually research or in my in some cases i actually have done so i can actually put that in with some degree of logical uh you know explanation so that people can actually learn things and another thing i like to do is that when i write a cliche i'm about to write a cliche i'm like oh i can't write a cliche but i can if i can find out the original cliche because oftentimes cliches are changed over time and they're ruined they don't make sense anymore so I will actually explain the original version of the cliche, in which case not only am I using the cliche, but I'm explaining to you how it got wrong, and you should know this because you'll learn something from that. From that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh. That's how I use it. Nice. Very cool. Interesting. I've never done computer gaming, though. That's never been a thing because, you know, fantasy, medieval, not a lot of electricity. <laughs> you you uh, woke her up again. So I know you have to go grab dinner and have some cocktails with your friends, so I don't want to keep you too long, but there is a question I'd like to ask. I have no friends. Yeah. <laughs> <There's>... <laughs> you are my friends. Oh, good. good. I hope... We're getting together later, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I have, I'm, always, I'm always up for an old-fashioned or two, or three. I, 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 right. I was just going to Dublin. I know a great pub over there. Yeah. Pretty much all of them. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, there's a lot of them, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. <laughs> So but we'll, we'll meet up that. in Dublin, break out the caviar, you know, the, yes. you know, the whole caviar, limousine no, no, experience. No, no, <laughs> I mean, this, this is grown legs. I like God. it. <laughs> yeah. But one question I like to ask all my guests is, uh, I think it's interesting what everyone's first job was. I think you learn a lot about someone and mm-hmm. their life experiences some, sometimes shaped their first job. But what was your first job? See, I thought your one question you're going to ask all your guests was how does it feel to be as handsome as you that are? was my second <laughs> i had to choose one or the other so uh, my first job well my very first job would have been you know paperboy uh after that i worked at a women's clothing store as the stock boy hmm. which was an interesting sort of class thing because all the young girls who were from my same school high school they came in all dressed to the nines because they were on the floor and we were stuck in the back with t-shirts and jeans where we were like you know like the troglodytes who were kept you know just holding boxes so that that was interesting and then then i went into uh i was a dishwasher at a fancy restaurant and uh, those kinds of things those were my first jobs uh but my first career job would have been uh as a uh as a designer you know, illustrator for a uh, a software company mm. in which I realized I was my time was being wasted there, and that's when I realized I could start my own advertising agency. Okay. Good lesson to learn. It's because I had learned this fancy thing like how to do art with the computer, and no one else knew how to do it at that time. I had to actually go to a printer and say, "I want to give you computer files and have you print them." And they went, "Really?" 
no one's ever done that. I said, yeah, we need to figure out how to do this. And we did. Yeah. And I was one of the first people to start submitting electronic files to printers. Wow. But that was fun. Nice. Yeah. Yes. Well, we know you're very busy. Lots of old fashions to drink. But thank you for coming by and hanging out with us for a little bit. If uh, anyone would like to find you or your work, where's the best place to connect with you? Well, I think the website still presently is www.rayura.com. And uh, although that may change, because my wife has some people working on that. Hopefully, that's still working. Mm -hmm. uh, Author Sullivan, I think, is still on Twitter or X, as they call it now. Um, <laughs> and hopefully, other people. It, it really, if you want to find me, just write Michael J. Sullivan into any Google browser. You'll find me. Nice. And Carl, where can people find you? Most social media, Carl D. Albert. And you can find my book on Amazon or wherever books are sold for the print copy. Yes, and Chris. You can find me, in, I'm just going to say primarily on your channel, on your podcast, but I also have my own YouTube channel, which I occasionally upload to, which is just my name, which is Chris Moen, where I talk about books and movies and storytelling in general. Yes. Thank you again, everyone, for coming by and hanging out. Thank Michael, thank you again for hanging out. Tell Robin that, uh, sorry, we took you away from uh, your afternoon for a couple hours. That's yeah, all right. Thank you, guys, and come back again when you can stay longer, and I can mix some drinks. Yes, nice. definitely. Don't don't tease us yeah. with a good time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Remember to bring your swim we will. or not. I mean, it's a secluded area. I mean, area, there will be know. drinks, so yeah. I just won't yeah. look. <laughs> just close your eyes. <laughs> all, right, all right, thanks everybody. See you later, guys. Take care.